Welcome, everybody. My name is Thomas Graf. I'm CTO and co-founder of iSurveillant. iSurveillant uh, initially created Cilin before we donated it to the CNCF. Long-time kernel developers. I'm coming from the lower levels and also currently chairing the eBPF Foundation. And I'm Liz Rice. I'm Chief Open Source Officer at iSurveillant. Um, you may, if you've been to KubeCons in the past, a long, long time ago, I was a, a chair of KubeCon and I used to be chair of the Technical Oversight Committee, which gave me this amazing privilege of seeing a lot across the whole cloud native landscape. And when I chose to come and work with Isovalent, the capabilities of Cilium and eBPF had really kind of stuck out to me. So I'm very excited to be working in this technology. So we're going to talk a little bit about how many proxies you need to run a service mesh. I think in this room, we don't really need to tell you what the service mesh is there for. And we probably don't need to tell you the history of how service mesh allows us to abstract functionality that is common across multiple applications. We no longer need to write that directly into an application or in a library. We want to abstract that out into sort of independent service mesh functionality that sits behind the application or in front, depending on your perspective. And for a long time, the model was to use sidecars. So you would have a proxy running in a sidecar container outside of the application, providing all these networking and resiliency and security and observability capabilities that we want to get from a service mesh. But sidecars come with downsides. They're complex to operate. They're complex to inject. They have additional resource needs. We'll dive into this in a little bit more detail in a moment. And they also require network packets to take a much more convoluted path through the stack. We, when we run in containers, our containers typically have their own network namespace, and we have to run a network stack inside the container, or inside the pod rather, and another network on the host. And if we have the proxy running inside the network namespace for the pod, we've got to kind of connect through that network stack twice before we even get as far as the host network. So there's a lot of path, a lot of processing for packets to go through before they've even left the pod. People have also found configuring sidecars pretty complex. And uh, I, I love this quote. I mean, it's, it's a couple of years old now, three years old now from Kelsey. But, uh, you know, complexity is a real issue with service mesh. So when I joined Isovalent, I remember Thomas telling me that Cilium was already kind of 80% service mesh. We were already providing a lot of the functionality that we expect from a service mesh in Cilium that is traditionally known as a CNI. So could we use this as a basis to remove sidecars and provide a sidecar free service mesh? And long story short, we did around this time last year, just about a year ago, we announced the Cilium Service Mesh Beta. Does anybody here, did anybody here try the Service Mesh Beta? We have a couple of hands up. Great, excellent. Um, this was a very kind of common comment that we got from people who signed up for, for that beta, that they really liked Envoy, but they'd found the overhead, the resource usage, the complexity of configuring sidecars, the complexity of getting, making sure that all their apps were instrumented, the additional network overhead, the latency involved, all these things were just putting people off from using service meshes. And so they were excited at the idea of Cilium providing a service mesh that didn't require sidecars. But I think something that got a little bit lost when we announced that was that we weren't saying we were completely removing proxies. There's still some proxy in there somewhere, as we'll see. And now, of course, we're not the only people talking about sidecar-free service meshes. Istio now also support a sidecar-free model. And you know, this, I think a lot of 
thought that actually getting, getting away from the sidecar model can give us a much simpler, more beautiful implementation. There's a really great podcast about that ambient mesh, uh, the Kubernetes podcast. Totally recommend it if you are interested in ambient mesh, taking a listen to that because it's really, um, really interesting to hear how those engineers, Ethan and Justin, thought about that model. And one, one of the, the quotes from that was, you know, they they'd thought for a long time that sidecars were inefficient and that users have a tendency to allocate resources for the worst case. So you can end up in this worst case scenario of resource allocation. When we move to uh, the Cilium model, one of the advantages we have is eBPF, where we can push lots of functionality into the kernel. We can share resources when we're using eBPF much more easily, partly because we're not constrained by this idea of having isolated pods. When you have a sidecar in a pod, by design, that sidecar is isolated from all the other sidecars. It's in a pod, deliberately isolated from everything else. When we push as much as we can of the service mesh functionality into the kernel, it is shared. And that can be a really good thing. The kernel is there to be shared amongst all the applications that run on it. I talked a bit about the convoluted network path that packets take through, uh, through a sidecar. Um, and when we move to a sidecar-free model, that shortens the path even through a proxy where that proxy is sitting on a node somewhere. So the ability to remove sidecars solves a lot of problems, but Thomas, where should the side, where should the proxy live? And uh, given my intro, maybe you already have a slight hint. Given I've been doing kernel development for majority of my career, I think proxy functionality, service mesh functionality, should be as transparent, as invisible as possible. And the kernel is actually a great place for this. But that does, this does not mean that then the kernel does need to solve all aspects. The kernel has always been delegating functionality from kernel space to user space, and we'll see a couple of examples. In the case of Cilium Service Mesh or Service Mesh in, in general, there are aspects that are not great matches to be solved in the kernel, such as TLS termination, HTTP authorization or complex HTTP parsing, and of course, identity management, TLS control handshakes, and so on. We'll get into the, into the details here. This means that Selim Service Mesh has this advantage that we can be eBPF native when possible and benefit from the performance gains of eBPF and then fall back to an Envoy proxy when eBPF is not the ideal instrument to implement. Other examples, I mentioned that this has actually have been, been the case for, for, for kernel development for ages. The kernel has always delegated some functionality to user space. Very good example is IDS. Uh, so, so Ricardo running in user space and doing deep packet inspection and using IP tables, NFQ to, to punch packets user space, or even just kernel module loading. When your laptop loads the Wi-Fi driver, it actually, the, the kernel module is getting loaded through a so-called user space mode helper. So let's look at what functionality can be done in eBPF native and where do we still need a proxy? And then we'll talk about the number of proxies afterward. So there's a lot of functionality that's already possible eBPF native without any proxy at all, purely in kernel space. Of course, any sort of L3, L4 forwarding, right? Any sort of L3, L4 load balancing, but also canary rollouts topology-aware routing, multi-cluster routing, network policy on layer three, layer four, and we'll talk about the details here, MTLS, as well as a variety of observability functions, uh, HTTP, TLS, so, uh, tracing, TCP, TCP, uh, DNS, TCP, UDP, observability, and so on. When do we still need a proxy are for use cases such as layer seven load balancing, for example, path-based load balancing, header-based load balancing, retries, layer seven rate limiting, 
as well as TLS termination and origination. Currently still in the proxy land is, now, is layer seven network policy. This is roadmap to be eBPF native, but currently not implemented yet. So this is the current split, which means that we can benefit from the eBPF performance and simplicity whenever possible. And if we cannot do it in eBPF, we essentially fall back to a proxy model. So what do these different possible models of where we put the proxy, what, what do they mean in terms of pros and cons? Because ever since we first discussed having sidecarless service mesh, people have been debating the pros and cons of where that proxy lives. So um, if we think back to the sort of original sidecar model, we had potentially a, 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 what could be seen as a security advantage that the proxy shared all the same isolation that the application pod did. So it naturally has access to the application's secrets. It's isolated in the same way as the application is. So from a security model perspective, you don't need to think about it anymore because it's the same as the application. And Cilium has supported this model for sidecars, uh, for service mesh for a long time now. It's, it has been possible it, and people are running Istio on top of Cilium as the networking layer, that, you know, that's a, a completely supported model. But if we want to move away from that, we want to not have a proxy for every one of our application pods. If we put the proxy on the node, what does that mean? Well, it means on the one hand, we have it's co-located on the same node, so our network path can be pretty efficient. But it does mean that if we have multiple tenants that are not on the same node, they can't all share that same proxy. You don't need to have additional proxies elsewhere on the network and you can, you can have this very, um, you, you have a, a proxy right next to you, which I think is a good thing. This is the kind of default model for Cilium service mesh today, where we would have one proxy per node. But we are working on the idea of having multi-tenancy by having multiple proxies running on the node. So that can give that isolation that people are potentially looking for. Another model that we're seeing now is this idea of having the proxy not necessarily co-located on the same node, but somewhere in the network. And that pretty much guarantees that there will be some extra network hops, but it does mean you can share that one proxy amongst multiple uh, instances that are in the same uh, service. And this is, you know, I would say a relatively new idea. It's something that we're interested in and we'd like to understand whether Cilium users would like to see this model. Because it would certainly be possible to implement that Z-tunnel approach in the Cilium layer. But I think most importantly, there isn't a single solution for, you know, you must have proxies, this number, this ratio of proxies to applications or this particular location of proxy relative to your applications. For some require, for some deployments, for performance reasons, you will choose to have a proxy on every node that will almost certainly give the highest performance and probably reduce complexity. In other environments, you may choose to uh, emphasize more multi-tenant isolation. In that case, you may want to have more proxies, perhaps as much as one proxy per application. So it does depend somewhat on your risk model and there is no single answer. What about encryption? What about encryption? <laughs> so we talked about number of uh, proxies and we figured it's actually interesting to look at the most common use cases of why you want to use or why you use service mesh and encryption and observability are probably among the top asks that you have. So let's look at encryption first. First of all, if we look at encryption, there is two broad models to achieve encryption. We can achieve it at the network level using functionality such as IPsec or WireGuard, where we essentially encrypt the entire network 
node to node. Um, this can be fine for many use cases and has been the status quo in networking for a long while, but it does rely or it does, it does require that you trust your node. So if the node gets compromised, the key on that node gets compromised and then the network encryption gets compromised until the key gets rotated. So it uses node identity. Um, that, can be, that can be great if that is your security assumption. What if we want deeper security, better security, and actually take it one level uh, further? Obviously, MTLS comes into play. The downside of MTLS as implemented with sidecars is that, first of all, it is shared with the layer seven proxy, which means that if the layer seven proxy gets compromised, all certificates and secrets in that proxy get compromised as well. And the second big downside of using sidecars for MTLS it, is that it's pretty much limited to TCP. And in particular, enterprise use cases will require multicast, UDP, SCDP, and a variety of other protocols that need to be supported. So we looked at this and, 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 and asked ourselves, can we support an MTLS model, a mutual authentication model, while benefiting from the network level to support any network protocol? And this is what we came up with. Um, for all the details on how exactly this works, I've linked the blog post that goes into the details. We'll also see the pull request uh, with the initial work later on. Essentially, this splits the authentication piece from the payload, from the data path. And this means that the authentication happens through a regular MTLS handshake where we can integrate with Spiffy, Serp Manager, and so on, and do a regular mutual authentication using certificates that are per service. And then instead of, instead of carrying the actual payload, the network data, the data in that MTLS connection, we carry that through the network directly while using the keys, the secrets that have been negotiated via the MTLS handshake using IPsec and WireGuard. And we kind of gain the benefits of both models where we get a strong mutual authentication handshake with MTLS while we can support any network protocol without introducing any sort of proxies. So we can establish encryption and mutual authentication network-wide without requiring proxies while supporting any protocol. Let's look at how this actually looks like, because let's say you're not using this and you're going, you're, you're, you're going down this road and want to use this. We are integrating this into Cilium Network Policy, which is, an which is an extension of Kubernetes Network Policy, and all Cilium users have to do is essentially opt into this and say, for these connections, let's say front-end talking to back-end, you need to authenticate. And as, so, as, 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 um, as soon as that uh, intent has been defined, Authentication is required before the connection can be established. The actual service uh, specific uh, certificates are in this case provided by Spiffy. Uh, Serp Manager integration is also on the roadmap, but currently the pull request and the issue that I've listed here on the slide is essentially um, enabling the Spiff integration that allows not only to generate certificates for each service and thus give uh, or make X509 certificates available to Cilium, it also allows us to actually tie network policy to Spiffy IDs, which means instead of selecting policy uh, by, by our Kubernetes labels, we can actually use strong Spiffy IDs. So essentially we solve two problems and ideally because Cilium already has a concept of identity, it simply or easily maps to Spiffy IDs and Spiffy service keys. What about observability, Liz? Well, observability is a pretty hot topic for us this week. <laughs> um, I want to actually give a shout out to Adam, who gave a talk earlier about how you can use eBPF to kind of gather metrics in a very efficient way, because basically that sort of shows the sort of underpinnings of what we, what we do here and, and how we're gathering some really good metrics and then making them available. So how am I going to do this? OK. My, actually, no, I'm going to show one more slide before I do that. We, this week, we're um, doing a lot of work with the team at Grafana to show off some really nice integrations between Grafana and Cilium. I'm just going to show you kind of the tip of the iceberg here, I think, with this, this demo today. But uh, there's, there's some really nice integrations here. So, demo time. <laughs> 
So I have a, an open telemetry demo app. I'm going to guess that some people here will be familiar with the app. It looks like this. I'm going to just refresh it just so I've started getting some network traffic. Um, and it's sitting behind uh, an ingress, which is a cilium. It's a Kubernetes ingress with, um, of cilium type. And as a result of that ingress being created, we should have, actually, let me see if I can find. No, I'll show this first. This ingress causes a Cilium Envoy configuration to be created, which is that one. And hopefully, I'm trying to do this with one finger. That's why I'm. <laughs> so that Envoy configuration was automatically created from uh, the ingress con uh, configuration. And what I'm looking for is the bit that says, here we go. It's basically going to send all traffic from, you know, slash anything to the demo front end. So this is a very, very simple uh, demo, but we are going through an ingress layer seven routing here. So, let's just do a little bit of um, telescope shopping to generate a bit of traffic. Um, I think we can buy these. I've bought a lot of telescopes today. It's quite, quite good. Come on, let's place order. I don't know why that didn't... doesn't really matter. I'm just trying to generate some traffic. And when I generate some traffic... You can see here at the right-hand side, those, those are my requests, my most recent requests. And here is me just checking that the demo works a few minutes ago. Um, and we get this really nice layer seven metrics generated by Cilium through eBPF. A lot of this, these metrics are being gathered by using eBPF. And uh, they're generated in Prometheus format, so they're very easy to pull into Grafana dashboards like this. Uh, getting things like the duration, the, the latency, rather, very nicely graphed out. We also get a service map. Now, if you're familiar with Cilium and Hubble, you will probably have seen the Hubble service map. This, this is something that you know, we've, we've had in Hubble for a while. And you can see individual network flows as well as the way those flows go to build up an overall service map. But we can now also see that service map inside the Grafana dashboard, I hope. There we go, yeah. So we have this really nice ability to gather metrics. It, as Adam was talking about earlier, it's very efficient and incredibly useful debugging and observability tooling available through this. I'll leave it to you to explain right. the rest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think we've seen a nice demo. Obviously, this also works for just pure network observability on the lower levels. We've seen the layer seven. Obviously, a three layer four, all of this comes integrated into um, kind of one set of dashboards. Very nice that Hubble UI can now directly embed Grafana dashboards. We can also do tracings. There is an example of a um, integration of spans uh, displayed in Grafana Tempo, generated by, by Hubble, as well as the Golden Signal dashboard that we've just seen. The last point, I think we've looked at observability, we looked at encryption, MTLS, observ uh, and the last part is kind of traffic management. So how is it possible to define and use traffic management in Solim Service Mesh? And we want to quickly show like what is the state of the individual configuration options that you have, Ingress, Gateway API, and Kubernetes services, as well as the Envoy config. The rest of the stack, I think, is hopefully pretty obvious. Obviously, Kubernetes has the control plane itself. You don't really need anything beyond that. Um, Kubernetes Secrets is the current identity management integration we have. And on the roadmap is Spiffy and Serve Manager, and then the data plane, eBPF, and Envoy. 
So let's look at these individual layer seven traffic management options. Ingress services, gateway API, and Envoy Config. Ingress and, and Envoy Config are already fully supported in 112. Um, services with annotations and gateway API are coming in 113. The code is actually complete. It's just not merged, but it's available in dev branches for testing if you are interested. I've linked the pull request with the branch links in there. Ingress. Very simple, it's simply fully conformant. Um, so it's a basic example of path-based or path-prefix-based routing using Ingress. And that's what you saw in the previous That's what we demo. saw in the demo, exactly. <laughs> Service annotations, like some of our users said, well, that's great, Ingress is great, but we really want to have this most simplest use case possible for layer seven load balancing. So we simply added a bunch of annotations to the Kubernetes services to enable least weighted, um, least uh, rated least request gRPC load balancing, where all you have to do is annotate your Kubernetes services with these two annotations and you get transparent gRPC load balancing. Very, very simple. And it gets better because Cilium has multi-cluster capabilities built in. Add another, another annotation to mark this service as global and voila, this service load balancing works across clusters now. So this is the simple, the simplest option, right? Okay, ingress, uh, services with annotations, and now gateway API, right? Initially or originally called ingress v2, probably the way forward for most of you how to define traffic management in the future. Um, we have the code complete to support uh, the latest gateway API spec. Uh, this is a typical example using the gateway and HTTP route resource. Also using uh, path, path prefix. And then the last option, and this is really kind of a low level building block, but it's also available to you as users. You can actually define and configure raw Envoy configuration in a custom resource. This is how the ingress controller and the gateway implementation actually map or use uh, Cilium Service Mesh. So they essentially translate into Cilium Service Mesh. But if you want to use this lower level API, you're absolutely free to do so. This way you can essentially use the full Envoy feature set in your own service mesh. Definitely, as you can even see in the example, definitely a lot harder to use, but with a lot more capabilities. And that is it from our side. I think we have um, a couple of minutes for questions. Thank you. Thank you. For, uh, for MTLS, you mentioned that the, there was an initial handshake that was uh, MTLS and then the data was pushed somewhere separately. Does that mean that data is encrypted and confidential? Yes, correct. So MTLS is used for the handshake. The MTLS handshake generates the secrets, the keys, uh, and they are handed down to WireGuard and IPsec where the symmetric encryption happens in the kernel. So HMAC and encryption is happening in the kernel, but the authentication, hand, authentication handshake is done in user space using MTLS. Thank you. Uh, when you use mutual tiers, do you use that also for exchanging the uh, certificates for the workload? And uh, when you use both mutual tiers and work guard, how do you avoid the double encryption? Because by default, mutual tiers has an encryption, right? So hopefully I got the question right. So we are using, um, in, this, in the example shown, either Kubernetes secrets or certificates created by Spiffy. So that those are service specific certificates for the MTLS model. And in our MTLS model, the data gets encrypted using IPsec and WireGuard. So it's, there is no additional TLS based encryption. There is no double, double encryption. Hopefully I got your question correct. Otherwise, please clarify. Yeah, I can follow later. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Uh, I didn't catch on that slide where you showed the service with the annotations. Was that a service of type load balancer? No. It is a, a cluster it's IP. It's a cluster IP service. Okay. Yes. Um, but it would actually also work with of type load balancer. So Cilium also implements type load balancer, and then the cluster IP portion just comes after it. So it also works for node port and load balancer. How do you get your envoy between the load balancer and where it's going? 
we use eBPF to inject Envoy into this picture. Like, cool. I got you. I got you. I got you. No worries. It's my my responsibility. You, you had I'm not 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 get paid for this, but you know I I take my responsibility seriously. Thanks, Thomas. <laughs> you you had one slide where you were showing alternative methods to sidecar proxy or even co-locating the proxy, and it was just a proxy on the network. Is is that kind of just taking that simple load balancer concept that we know from from yesteryear? That was I guess an, a nod towards the our understanding of how ambient mesh is doing proxies, that they're not specifically located on any given node. I mean, we've kind of shown it floating in space. I think it would be on a node somewhere, but it, m the point was more, it's not specifically associated with the, the node where an application is running. It could be in space. It, it could be in space. <laughs> Oh, yeah, proxies Is it fair space. to say it oh, can be like a part of namespace or something like that, kind of a little bit more abstracted? Yeah, I mean, I think for both models where it's on the node or on the network, any granularity could work, right? I think it's more just location versus grab. I think the benefit of the network model is that you can share that proxy for the same tenants that are not on the same nodes, whereas if you're on that node, you share it only with tenants on that same node. That's the, the clear difference. And I think that's a great example of a trade-off where you might minimize network hops in order to but you may have to have multiple instances. So I think from a Cilium service mesh perspective, we're interested to support both models. So if you want us to also support like the proxy on the network model and support waypoints, file a GitHub issue or just talk to us on Slack and we're, we're happy to add it. I th like it's actually very compatible with how we think about service mesh as well. Hey, fantastic talk. Um, it, with the like sidecar for every pod, you kind of, those individual Envoy instances are only gonna have their tunnels to whatever the application happens to be talking to, right? Whereas in, you know, the on the node one, this was, I know this came up in the Istio example as well. It's like on the node, you've now got like a single Envoy instance that's gonna have to do all the WireGuard or IPsec tunnels from every application on that node to every application that that's talking to. Like, are there any concerns around overloading an instance? Like, I don't know, I presume there's been a lot of testing on this. I'm kind of curious if you can talk about how that's worked for like larger clusters. Yeah, so I think the benefit is that uh, on the proxy on the node model together with IPsec and WireGuard, we don't need any tunnels at all. It's purely on the network level and that works for 10,000s of nodes. So that, that uses the, the standard Selenium network layer encryption. So we're not actually creating tunnels, like peer-to-peer -peer tunnels at all on, on, that, on that node. But maybe maybe clarify your question because I think I got it wrong based on your. But we can also talk outside. You know, well, I think we have a time for one more question, and I think I have. Uh, we can use it for one last question. Hi, thank you. That was a great talk. I was wondering um, for requests that need to go through that Envoy proxy. Um, how do you scale that? proxy as the requests um, increase? What mechanism do you have there? Yeah, so Envoy has several mechanisms. First of all, you can define the number of listeners, like how many threads Envoy can use. And then we also limit the resource per listener. So when we have a shared Envoy instance, we actually configure a separate listener for every ingress and for every egress use case or a pod that actually needs and we limit the number of HTTP requests or, or layer 4 requests or layer 4 connections and scale by the number of um, threads. And obviously it's also subject to the CPU memory limits that you configure. All right, so um, let's get a round of applause to Liz Thank and you. Thomas.